Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar in our Mining Challenges series. Today, we're going to focus on enhancing safety. And before we get started, I'm just going to go through some housekeeping tips with you. If you're on a PC or Mac, you'll notice that you've got five main windows on your screen. The big window in the center is the one where most of the content will show up and the video and the Q&A section. And then in the top right hand corner, you've got the chapter slides that'll show the relevant topic that we're discussing at the time. On the top left hand side, you've got some brief bios of our speakers and participants. And then on the bottom left hand side, we've got some links to some resources that you can take with you during or after the webinar. If you have any questions throughout the session, uh, either while I'm talking with the main content or during the Q&A session, just type them in that window on the bottom right hand side and they'll come through to us live as we're going. And then we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end. Finally, you'll notice a few widgets at the bottom of your screen. If any of the windows I just described aren't present or visible, you can bring them up by clicking on any of those widgets. Or if you need any help at any time, you can just hit the help icon. If you're on a mobile device, the content is arranged a little bit differently. You'll notice a video camera icon in the top right hand corner of your screen. You can click on that to bring up the video content that'll go full screen on your device. If you want to access the questions or the resources or any of those, just hit done or escape out of the video window and you'll see all of those resources available on the main screen. And you can switch back and forth between any of them at any time. Okay, so let's get down to the main content of this webinar, which is enhancing safety. Safety, as we all know, is our top priority within the mining industry. And what I'm going to talk about today is the main safety concerns that keep us up at night, or the things we think about to make sure that we get everyone home safely every day. We're going to talk about collisions, as well as equipment damage operator fatigue and distraction that's starting to get a lot of attention these days, hazardous conditions at the mine site. We're going to talk a little bit about operator skills and things we can do to help improve safety there. And then finally we're going to touch on some incident response. So if we think about incidents and why they occur, what is it that leads to an incident? Is it uncert uncertain or unsafe conditions or is it behaviors that are the main contributors. If we look at incidents that occur due to unsafe conditions versus behaviors that lead to incidents, 90% of those incidents are a result of behaviors. Only 10% of safety in incidents occur as a result of unsafe conditions. So it's safe to say that behavior that is risky or at-risk behavior will eventually lead to an incident. So how do we make sure that we get everybody home safely every day? We talk about the layers of protection as part of our mine safety culture. You've got the policies and the procedures that you need to put in place for people to adhere to, just the general mentality of the culture that people need to follow at the mine site, leading by example, um, you've got training that needs to take place. So training in procedures and processes, training in the safe operation of equipment and technologies, and training in the mentality of always being alert and aware of hazards that exist. Scheduling, so the crew roster, making sure that our operators aren't getting too fatigued over their 12-hour shift or however long the shift is, especially on night shift making sure that the roster allows for adequate travel time and rest time so that they're not fatigued by the time they're working. And then of course you've got the technologies. Some are at the end of the chain, some are earlier on. For example, a technology to monitor fatigue and distraction. This is a great tool, but there should be many steps taken prior to leveraging that tool to keep our operators alert and awake and safe. Let's start with some of the easy stuff. Collisions and equipment damage. Operator visibility is high on the list of safety initiatives for mining companies. In fact, visibility is one of the top 15 priority areas identified by the Earth Moving Equipment Safety Roundtable. If you think about visibility in a large mining truck, that operator in that haul truck has very limited visibility around them, especially to the right hand side and to the rear of the truck. Collisions can also 
occur due to fatigue or distraction, and they can lead to injuries or fatalities, unscheduled repairs due to equipment damage, and even lost production due to downtime or safety investigations. I know what you're thinking. You've got an experienced operator team and they're very safe drivers and they're not going to experience any collisions. Well, some further research that we've done indicates that nobody is immune. It doesn't matter whether you have 25 years experience or two years experience. There's still that chance that a collision could occur. Looking at technology as that outer layer of protection as part of our safety initiative and safety culture at site, what tools does Caterpillar provide through the MindStar family to help us? I talked about the study on collisions at mine sites. This actually led to the development of a product within the Detect family called Object Detection. Object Detection is all about increasing situational awareness for our operators at slow speed or at startup. And it helps improve their visibility and avoid collisions. Within the fleet family, you get a feature called position awareness that increases the operator awareness of all the other equipment and vehicles around them. Terrain enables the creation and management of avoidance zones to keep operators and equipment out of areas that they shouldn't venture into. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail soon. And of course, with command, we're going to shut down the autonomous or semi-autonomous or remote control equipment before anything is allowed to happen. That could be if a person or equipment or light vehicle ventures into the autonomous operating zone when they shouldn't, or if somebody tries to run a dozer to a location that they shouldn't, or in the underground space, we won't let them run into a wall to prevent collisions and damage that way. I mentioned operator fatigue and distraction. Here in the United States, the number of collisions on our highways due to fatigue and distraction have actually started to exceed the number of collisions due to driving under the influence of controlled substances. When I was in an MSHA class recently, the instructor talked about our culture and our mentality and how the things that we do at home and in our personal lives will transfer to how we operate at work. For example, when you're driving in the car and you run a stop sign here or there, that behavior is likely to occur when you're driving your light vehicle at the mine site as well. More than 10 years ago, Caterpillar Global Mining became aware of a threat with the potential to halt production and drive significant costs. More than that, it's a threat against human life and limb. What makes the threat so ominous is that people will never see it coming. It's a threat that's so hard to see, it's practically invisible. How do you protect your organization against an invisible threat? For more than a decade, customers have been approaching CAT, approaching our experts, and asking, how does it happen? Do you think it's equipment failure? Do you think it's poor conditions? Now, if you remember earlier I referenced, most incidents are caused by behaviors, and only 10% are caused by poor conditions. So what could it be? One of our experts, Dr. Dave Edwards, who has his PhD in human factors, had a hunch. Dave began to investigate emerging technologies that would help improve his hypothesis. Soon he discovered a group of Australian engineers that had developed a technology that uses artificial intelligence to track eye movement and interpret facial expressions that indicate what we call microsleeps. Dr. Edwards had an idea to use the software to activate an alarm that would wake fatigued drivers in mining trucks. At the time, the Australian company was only interested in research tools and automotive. However, Dr. Edwards saw a huge potential for, for the technology within the mining industry and encouraged them to adapt it for mining, and they did. As a result, we now have a system that provides visibility to fatigue and distraction events, events that were previously part of the invisible threat. Have a look at this example. These are fatigued operators running fully loaded haul trucks. Here's an example of distracted operators, texting on the phone, looking out the windows, reading, believe it or not, can drive distraction. These were all recorded with that product that the Australian engineering team developed called the driver safety system. Have a look at this. 
Using the driver safety system, we can see that there are opportunities to significantly reduce fatigue events. In this example here, in the first segment of the graph, this is where we're measuring and recording events. In the second section, we start to mitigate. We shake the seat when the operators get fatigued or distracted. You can see the dramatic reduction in fatigue and distraction events. But then they st slowly start to increase. And that's because the operators get used to it and they get complacent. So then we really start to manage. We go through the change management process, the training process. We work hand in hand with our customers to put a program in place, manage fatigue, manage the crew roster, all of those things. And that's how we start to sustain those gains. And that's how we achieve incredible numbers like this, like an 80% reduction in fatigue and distraction events in this particular example. In 2011, the US Department of Transportation sponsored an analysis of the relationship between operator effectiveness and the economic impact of rail accidents. They used data from the Federal Railroad Administration gathered between 2003 and 2005. During that time, there were 1,300 reportable incidents, 350 of which reported a human factor root cause. What they found was for people operating at 70% effectiveness or below, the accident risk actually increased by 62% with an economic risk impact of over 400%. However, if they were well rested and 90% effective or better, the accident risk decreased by 30% and the economic risk or impact also decreased by as much as 400%. So let's pick up on that thread of accident-related economic impact and apply it to a mining example. This is a 140 million ton per annum open pit mine in Africa. They have a fleet of 72 haul trucks consisting of 793s, 777s, and 785s. And they had a hunch that 60 to 70% of their haul truck incidents were a result of fatigue. In 2011, their accident-related costs that they attributed to fatigue were around $2.4 million. In 2012, they started to roll out in-cab fatigue monitoring technology and saw $1.4 million reduction in economic impact and accident-related damage. In 2013, the system was fully deployed and they focused on change management and training and the culture side of things which resulted in another $985,000 in accident-related cost reduction, or a 90% reduction in fatigue-related accidents, and a total of $2.38 million in savings per year, every year. A really good shining example of success as it relates to the layers of protection around a safety culture. Recently, we learned about an incident in the oil sands near Fort McMurray in Canada. Both the operator of the truck, who was new, and the experienced operator trainer fell asleep. And it led to an incident like the one pictured in this photo, where the truck was severely damaged. So that's on the mine site. What about off the mine site? In this example here, this past March, the Australia Mining Safety Journal published an article about an employee injured off-site due to fatigue. The company had a policy that he had to check out of his lodging at the mine site by 10 a.m. So he had finished his shift at 6 a.m., only got a few hours sleep, and then had to check out by 10. He got injured on his way home and, as a result, sued the company. This is a great example of within the layers of protection, the core layer of protection being culture. This is a prime opportunity to manage the culture at that mine site so that the operators can get the proper rest that they need and can be safe not only on shift, but can be safe off shift as well. The human brain is like a biological computer. It can't just run continuously all the time. It needs to rest and recharge its batteries, just like your laptop does. The difference is, in our laptop, we can run it till the batteries are dead. 
In our human brains, we can only run them till our batteries are about 70% dead, and then we need to recharge them. Research has shown that humans operating below 70% effectiveness behave the same and act the same as somebody with a blood alcohol content of 0.08, which in the United States is legally drunk. If an employee came into work and said to their manager, I'm drunk, they'd probably get sent home. But think about this. What if an employee came into work and said, I'm tired? Wouldn't we just send them to work? Here's an operator on a 14-day rotation. This is a 3 a.m. wake time and a 6 a.m. start of shift. On days one through four, we can see that he's above 70% effective. The bright white lines are his wake cycle and his work cycle. The dips and the dimmer lines are the time that he's spending asleep. You can see on day five, he starts to dip below 70% effectiveness. And remember, we said below 70% effectiveness is the same as being intoxicated to a blood alcohol content of 0 0.08. On day six through day 13, he's spending his entire shift below 70% effectiveness or spending his entire shift fatigued. And then on his last day of shift, he's heavily fatigued before going off rotation. So here's an example where you can have a look at scheduling and things that we can do to help reduce fatigue during shift. If we were to take the same operation, allow our operator to sleep in until 4 a.m. and have a 7 a.m. start of shift, you can see that he spends significantly more of his awake and on shift time above 70% effectiveness. He dips below slightly on day seven and day eight but really the majority of the time that he's working, he's above 70% effectiveness and he's more alert just by shifting his schedule by one hour. Fatigue is natural. Humans are the only ones that try and fight sleep. All other animal and beings just sleep when they need to. Would you like to see some eye-opening stats? These are some metrics we got from the driver safety system developed by the Australian engineering team I referenced earlier. Running on over 5,000 pieces of equipment in the mining industry, we've seen over 4,400 miles traveled with operators asleep at the wheel, almost 2 million distraction events, and 350,000 confirmed fatigue events in about 18.3 million operational hours at mine sites. Think about that. More than 4,400 miles traveled with operators asleep at the wheel of heavy equipment. A mine manager in Australia told us that his single biggest opportunity to reduce incidents, injuries, and fatalities is to control fatigue and distraction through cultural management, processes, scheduling, and technologies. And the director of health and safety at FMI told us that they've reduced their incidents from 100 per shift to less than a dozen by interrupting fatigue and distraction. So we've talked quite a bit about the safety culture and the layers of protection and products like DSS, which are part of the Detect family. Fleet also helps with crew roster management and scheduling. And Terrain helps prevent inadvertent operator errors. Don't forget about the Q&A box available on your screen where you can post questions to us at any time and we'll answer them there and we may even address them during our live Q&A session. Now I'm going to talk about hazardous conditions and keeping operators out of harm's way. Even at the safest mine or safest operation, hazardous conditions can still exist. It could be due to unstable terrain, could be due to slides, could even be to excessive dust or noise. What about on stockpiles where we're pushing material into hoppers? There's plenty of hazardous conditions that exist in that environment. Let's focus on that a little bit. So in stockpiling operations where a dozer is pushing material into a hopper, what tends to happen occasionally is the operators get too close and the dozer can go in. Sometimes it ends up in the hopper with an operator in it. And this can lead to injury and shutdown of the 
hopper, and potentially the mine site while we conduct a safety investigation. One of the things that terrain does is it provides 3D avoidance zones. So you can create a cone-shaped avoidance zone around the hopper, and as the operator is pushing material, if he gets too close to that cone of avoidance, the system will alert him, and if he enters the zone, it will alert him even more strongly. But it's still an operator on the machine. And there's two things that could happen. They could still choose to ignore the warnings from the system, or they may actually need to enter that avoidance zone if the material starts standing up more vertically. We have to break it loose somehow, so what they'll tend to do is they'll go into this hazardous zone, and if the material breaks free, the dozer could end up in the hopper. So how do we deal with that? Well, what if we just take the operator off the dozer? The operator can then run the dozer remotely out of harm's way. Even if the material stands up, they can run the machine into the hazardous area to get it to break loose, and in case the dozer actually does fall in, then we're only going to be shut down as long as it takes to get the dozer out. Nobody's going to get hurt, and we're not going to need to conduct a big safety investigation that shuts us down for days. So in that best practices example that we just spoke about, we learned about how terrain and also command for dozing can help keep operators out of hazardous conditions. But in the detect family, we also have tools to help. Within proximity awareness, we've got speed limit zones and avoidance zones that we can set up by machine class so that only certain types of equipment or vehicles are allowed to go into certain areas and all others have to stay out. Or, in the fleet family, we've got position awareness, which shows all operators of light vehicles and equipment, the other equipment and vehicles around them. Now I'm going to talk about operator performance and how it can impact safety. The more skilled an operator is to operate a specific piece of equipment, the more efficiently and safely they're going to be able to operate it. Let's talk about a case study with Kiewit Buckskin Mine here in the United States. They established a goal to improve operational safety, efficiency, and productivity through operator training by focusing on these elements here. We asked Stephen Mullaney, Kiewit Mining's area manager, about their experience, and here's what he had to say. Since implementation of MindStar and targeted training at the Immersive Technology Simulator in late summer of 2011, we have realized a 15% improvement of shovel productivity, a 21% improvement in truck payloads, resulting in a 5% improvement of operating cost. Also, operator-induced errors have been reduced by 97%, resulting in annual equipment maintenance savings of over a million dollars. After about a month, however, they started to see the numbers rebound, and they saw a gap between the training and the application in the field. They implemented policies and procedures to monitor and manage not only the training, but the application in the field in order to sustain those gains. And you remember policies is one of those layers of protection we talked about earlier, when we talked about the layers of protection in keeping our people safe. Loopy, the MindStar manager at Buckskin Mine, told us that MindStar does more than just reduce inefficiencies. It provides awareness and ensures individual operator accountability, which helps them stay on top of things. We've talked about operator performance and improving safety at the mine site. Within the fleet family, we're able to manage operators through licensing and training and ensuring that only operators trained and licensed for the appropriate piece of equipment can be scheduled to run it. Within the train family, we provide live operator performance feedback as well as back-end reporting. And then, of course, in the detect family, we reduce unsafe practices and behaviors through management, measurement, and reporting of unsafe incidents and behaviors. And in the Kiewit Buckskin case study that we just talked about, they leveraged immersive simulators, which help provide virtual operator training as close to their real experience of operating equipment as possible. Don't forget about our resources available for download, including the white paper on this session. Up until now, we've talked about enhancing safety at your operation and things that we can do to avoid incidents. But incidents will happen, even at the safest mine site in the world. Technology enables us to understand where all of our equipment is and where all of our personnel are, 
so that we can respond more rapidly. CAT MindStar provides open lines of communication through Mayday functionality within every one of our capability sets in case the radio is clogged up with chatter or down. And then of course in proximity awareness we've got incident playback functionality. Here's an example of a rubber tire working around a shovel that had a near miss. Because of the playback functionality in proximity awareness, management is able to review the incident, understand and dissect the situation, and then decide if they need to make any policy or process changes to ensure that it doesn't happen again. In summary, we talked about incident response and knowing where all of our equipment and operators are on the mine site. Fleet enables this. We talked about Mayday functionality, which is available across the MindStar family. And then we talked about incident playback in proximity awareness, which also has avoidance zone capabilities and conditional zone capabilities. All of these factors help contribute to more rapid incident response should something happen at the mine. I'm going to step over to our mine safety panel now to talk more about some of the challenges that you may face in your operation in trying to address safety and the tools that Caterpillar has to, available to help. Okay, so now's the part of the webinar where we start addressing your questions that have been coming in. And we've got a panel of experts here to help us. We've got Bill Deers, our <coughs> technology manager from CAT Global Mining. We've got Todd Dawson, our fatigue expert from CAT Safety Services. And Gary Cook, our safety expert from CAT Global Mining as well. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. And we want to extend a welcome to everyone that's uh, joining us in the audience out there tonight. Um, we appreciate you tuning in. We're going to take care of a couple housekeeping issues first. Uh, if you look at the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see something that's called the Resource Center. Uh, in there, you can download a copy of the white paper, which is uh, the, the notes from the presentation you just saw Craig give. And then I will also re reference that point here a little bit later on. Also, if we use your question today, uh, we will be sending you a uh, CAT MindStar uh, cap um, as just a, a little token to say thank you very much. If we do not get to your questions, we will respond to everyone's questions offline within about 24 hours. So with that, let's go ahead and, uh, and get going here to the group. And Todd, the first question that came in as, as Craig was uh, presenting was, how can, you, how can mining companies help make employees feel comfortable with the technology that's being put in the cap? Yeah, uh, and, and that's a question that comes up quite often. As you can imagine, it'd be a bit disconcerting hopping in the uh, cab of your, your vehicle and, and suddenly there's a camera there pointed at you. So uh, the way we uh, approach that is to do a lot of communication up front, uh, awareness and, and wanting people to understand what the technology does, how it works, uh, and, and what to expect. Um, a piece of that is knowing what's going to happen uh, when there are fatigue-related events that, that are detected by that, sy that system. So the, the communication and, and the education up front is, is a key part of that. Excellent. So Gary, you know, while we're putting technology in to help avoid incidents, if there is an incident, how does the CAT MindStar system help uh, a mining company uh, explore what happened? That's one of the great features of the system, Bill, is that uh, we do capture events and incidents in the office. So any type of event, such as a proximity event where the machines come too close to each other, uh, avoidance zone entry, speeding events, even a radar event if the, system, if the machine is equipped with object detection, they're all captured in that back office. And then you can play them back on a mind map and see exactly what happened, uh, determine who the operator was, the time, the location, and such information. So it's very helpful. Okay, excellent. So Craig, uh, Gary mentioned about avoidance zones, and during the presentation you also talked about avoidance zones. Do these also work in the blast areas? Yeah, Bill, that's a really good example of a place to use an avoidance zone. So in the blast areas, you generally just want your blast hole drills in there, and then, you know, once the drills have moved on, your, um, your info trucks and that kind of thing. So what we can do is we can set up conditional avoidance zones that those, those types of vehicles or those roles would be allowed in there, but um, someone else in a light vehicle, some other supervisor or someone... Uh, in a different capacity isn't allowed in that area and if they enter they're warned to leave and uh, we get that reporting in the back office as well 
And then, of course, we've got avoidance zones across the other capability sets as well. So even if you have terrain, you can use avoidance zones within terrain. It's not just all about proximity awareness. Okay. Very good. So, Todd, um, coming back to you on the fatigue management system. So the shift change, you've got different operators getting in the cab. Does the operator have to do anything? You know, we've got different size operators, et cetera. Do they have to do anything to get the system right for them? Right, so the, the system uh, requires no input or interaction from the operator. Uh, and it doesn't matter uh, if they're seated high in the seat, if it's a tall person or it's uh, someone that's uh, not as tall or they sit, sit very low in the seat, that system will automatically capture the face, capture the eyes, uh, usually within two or three seconds. Uh, but it doesn't require them to enter their badge number or employee number or any other information. It just simply starts working as soon as they hop into the truck. So, no, there's no, no user input or interaction that's required at all. Great. So that's making sure then for every operator it's going to work correctly. Absolutely. Yeah, it's quite a fascinating technology. It actually recognizes where the eyes are and where the mouth is and where all the fa facial features are so there's no physical adjustment and then you know once the software is dialed in which only takes a few seconds then then it's monitoring from there so quite a r wide range of view plus um, you know it, it's because it's infrared technology it's able to see through um, dark glasses or sunglasses so you know it's really not intrusive to the operators they can just wear their normal PPE or their eye protection or um, sunglasses and sunny days and the system just figures it out on its own. Well, that was a question that we had earlier, Craig, the building on that. Does that infrared light, does it have any impact on the eyes at all? Well, we'll let Gary comment on that <coughs> one, I think. Yeah, so I, actually, uh, it, it's, a, it's a safe system. Um, if you're going to spend, let's take for an example, if you're going to spend all day outdoors in the sunlight, you're getting twice as much infrared. Um, I guess focus as you would as you're in the cab. Another way to look at it, this has been in, independently confirmed, is um, it's about 1% of what is deemed as a safe level of infrared. So we're far below the levels for okay. any so danger. Yes. So no concerns there. Uh, so Craig, um, one way of you know keeping the operators safe is taking them out of the cab. So right. let's talk a little bit about the remote control systems. Um, so we have several types of remote control systems for command for dozing. Can you give an idea what's the range of the remote control systems? How far away can you be? Yeah, sure. So we've got three levels of the remote control dozer system. We've got the over-the-shoulder console, which is a short-range remote control system. So basically the range is line of sight. When the operator needs to get off to do some work for a short period of time, pretty much as, as long as they can see the dozer, they'll be within range and they'll be fine. And the same applies to what we call the line of sight operator station. That's where it's longer term, you know, maybe we're working whole shifts remotely. They've got a comfortable station that they sit at that looks like the inside of the cab of a dozer. And again, as long as they can see the machine, um, they'll be within range. Then, of course, the flagship product in that family is the non-line of sight system, which is all about remote operation centers. So there, we put a communication infrastructure in place to ensure that um, our range is basically unlimited. Uh, what a lot of our customers will do is they'll run fiber optic links between their mine sites and their remote operation centers, and then you've got your wireless infrastructure at site to transfer all the video and control information through. Okay, so really you've got quite a range here. Absolutely. As you look at it. So, Todd, uh, you know, as you work for the safety, Caterpillar Safety Services Group, I know you've done a lot of research on things. So how does what a employee does off hours impact their job during the, you know, during their shift? Yeah, that's... You know, one of the concerns that often uh, raises its head when you talk about fatigue is, you know, a, a, a mine. They can do a lot of things to help their employees. They can provide training and education on how to manage fatigue and, and shift work. Uh, they can provide uh, schedules that are supportive and provide opportunity for sleep. And the question then comes, well, what if they don't use that opportunity? And one of the benefits that we find with the technology is that um, it's always there as that last line of defense. So, you know, most of us do a good job, and, and I haven't really met uh, an operator yet that doesn't try to do their job safely, but there are still times, if you talk to anybody that works a night shift, most of the time they get tired at some point, and the technology is designed specifically to capture and prevent those times when we've really tried to do our best to, to prepare and, and be uh, fit for work, 
but something goes wrong and, and fatigue starts to intrude uh, into our operation and the, the technology, again, is designed to, to capture that and prevent it uh, through the alarms. Okay. Yeah, as a matter of fact, today I was talking to one of our people. Um, he ran a haul truck for three months out of one of our customer sites. So they do 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shifts. And um, they call between 12 a.m. and 2 a.m. the hardest time for these truck operators on these trucks in that type of a shift configuration. And they just have to come up with techniques to, to fight the fatigue. And, you know, that's where this, this CAT safety services assessment really comes into play nicely because you can have a look at the whole picture. It's not just about in shift. It's, it's, it's the crew's time outside of shift as well. And you saw the example earlier in this presentation where just shifting the, just shifting the start time by an hour had such an impact. But it's out there. It's happening. And, uh, you know, just another example today that, that reinforced that. Just yeah, it just really shows the value of the data and what the data can do to help run the operation Absolutely. and your, you know, more safely. Well, it starts mm -hmm. to provide visibility to something that traditionally is very difficult sure. to quantify, uh, and it helps us once we can see it, we can manage it. Absolutely. So, Gary, this question is coming in two parts. The first part of the question deals with if you can describe the difference between uh, object detection and proximity awareness. That's the first part. I'll, okay. I'll wait for the second part here in a minute. All right. All right. Yeah. So, so object detection is a, is a radar-based system really designed for machine startup and initial movement. So once you get moving past uh, 20 meters if you're set to distance or uh, 5 miles an hour if you're set to a speed-based configuration, the system actually goes into a standby, can't, standby mode. The cameras remain active, but the radars are in standby. Proximity awareness is GPS based, so it's using GPS locations of the other machines around, and that's where we're projecting paths. We've got zones defined around the machine. Uh, you can set up the avoidance zones, what have you. And then that gives indications to the operator of how close they are to, to other machines. So it's active all the time. Whereas, again, object detection is more that, that initial movement in, in uh, startup. Okay, so with that said, you know, the second part of the question deals mm -hmm. with uh, can object detection be added to, an ex if you have uh, like cat fleet or terrain, can you add, uh, I'm sorry, can you add proximity awareness to it? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and another great feature of, of, of the system is we've got common componentry between, <laughs> say, fleet and proximity and awareness. So if you're using mid-precision receivers, which is basically what we sell now with Fleet, um, really you're adding software at that point, which makes it relatively easy. And the same with terrain. We've got uh, proximity awareness functionality built into terrain. So again, if you're, if you're using the G610 displays on the latest release of software, it's just a matter of adding software. Okay. Yeah, and of course down the road, right, if, they, if, if these are mine sites that are on a path towards autonomy, these are all the building blocks, right? So this is a little bit of a sneak peek of one of our upcoming webinars, but um, PA is used at our command for hauling sites. We use terrain to call the trucks in. All of the MindStar system components work together and play together, and, and none of them are throwaway. So they really mm -hmm. build on top of each other, which from a change management perspective, as well as from a cost perspective, uh, makes it uh, better for our customers to grow um, over, over time as they develop. Well, that actually works in really well to the, one of the questions that was asked here. We've been spending a lot of time talking about CAT, okay? Uh, are this, is this just CAT technology that's designed to work on CAT equipment or can it work on other brands or mixed fleets? You know, that's interesting. We get that question a lot because we're an OEM that, that's also a technology provider. And all of these technologies work on any OEM's equipment. Um, hey, we love those yellow sites that are all cat yellow, but there's many, many sites in the world that have uh, equipment from other OEMs. And because we're deploying site solutions, uh, it's imperative that we make sure that, that our um, technologies and our systems work across the brands. Excellent. And maybe just add, too, sure. that the, the fatigue technology is similar in that it can be retrofit into any, any equipment, really. Okay, perfect. So we have a complete system for yes. everyone. Uh, speaking of fatigue, um, Craig mentioned, you know, he showed the graphic that showed an operator over time and kind of fallen below the 70% level. Uh, how do you know that that operator has fallen below that level? So the, the system at the, that Craig was uh, highlighting there is based on a, a massive body of research uh, that looks at performance, uh, 
and triggers that, that take into account how much sleep a person has had, uh, how long it's been since they've slept, uh, and some other factors and essentially creates a performance score or an effectiveness score. Uh, but you can imagine that if someone is awake for 24, 26, 28, 30 hours, uh, the performance has declined. Uh, the, the trick or the benefit of the technology really is uh, that it can uh, quantify then what's the, the outcome or what's the risk uh, that that person is experiencing at, at any given time. Now this is a service too that CAT Safety Services provides, going in and looking at MindSight. Can you expand on that a little bit? Right, so uh, within our, our toolkit are many different technologies, the, the DSS, which we, we've talked some about today, uh, but we have other technologies that, that really are focused on the individual, um, you know, into the question that, that came in about uh, what does a person do off shift, uh, how much sleep are they getting, and, and trying to really build an awareness uh, for the individual of the, the choices they make and how that can impact uh, their performance while they're at work and and off shift too. So we've really combined a, a suite of technologies to, to help us really assess uh, fatigue at, at a site. Excellent. So uh, talking about real-time questions, so the add-on to that is, is there a device you're using then to get that data off of the person? Yeah, so uh, on the individual level, uh, we have, uh, it's called the CAT Smart Band. Uh, which is a wearable device. People will be familiar with uh, the Fitbit or the fuel bands, uh, similar kind of technology. Uh, this one is very specific to sleep and fatigue. Uh, so the CAT Smart Band is that individual wearable technology that we use to, to uh, build a picture or a profile of uh, the individual's fatigue and alertness levels. Excellent. All right. Uh, so with that, um, Craig, just one last question here if you can. Just if you could highlight again the, the full suite of CAT uh, safety offerings that we have. So we've got the object detection which Gary talked about a little bit and uh, we talked about earlier in the presentation. Um, so that includes not only the radar systems but straight vision systems, camera systems basically. We've got proximity awareness where we're building on top of that and we're providing a much broader view um, of the situation around the operator of any equipment, uh, increasing their situational awareness. Um, and of course we've got the driver safety system as, as part of our fatigue management plan and then the services that we provide through CAT safety services with, uh, with the site assessment, um, the fatigue risk assessment on site. Um, so that's kind of with, within the detect family but terrain and fleet and command, all of those products, they all have safety components of them like avoidance zones and crew roster management and that type of thing as well. Very good. So I see we're, it's time for us to wrap up. So I just wanted to mention to everyone, first of all, thanks for the panelists for joining us, Craig, for the presentation. Obviously, for you taking the time to join us here today. Uh, you will be getting a survey after this. We'd love to get your feedback because, again, these sessions is, are designed for you, and we'd love to see what we can do with each one of these series to, to, bring, uh, to bring the message home and what we can offer for you. Um, in addition to that, I uh, want to just promote that the CAT Safety Services does do a, uh, an ongoing series of seminars. They have one coming up on October 21st, which is in two days, uh, at 10 a.m. Central Daylight Time. And uh, it's, the topic is CAT Inspect, a new tool to help you see and mitigate risk. So with that, again, thank you, and thank you for joining us, and I hope everyone has a great and safe day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.